Oh. Okay, we're live on the air. That was exciting. I pushed the button. <laughs> I was going to say you should warn everybody that they're about to be posted on the internet forever, but oh, they probably okay. already know that. <laughs> I was thinking we did that now, but you're right. It's too late now, isn't it? Everybody yeah. on the air. So, But that's the way this user group is supposed to work. Um, <laughs> you can watch it uh, anonymously via YouTube, but uh, we're live. And this should be interactive. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jen, um, or, or just get us started. Um, I would, just, uh, I don't know if everybody knows each other. Um, only, Wilbur, I think you're the only one that has a mic that can talk. Um, I don't mic. If, uh, I mean, it, 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 as a general practice for these user groups, I'd like us to start with quick introductions. Uh, so if you don't have a mic and you want to say hello and something about yourself in the chat, go ahead. Um, we This is our second user group. We had the first one on uh, config management. Uh, today we're going to talk about layouts. These are intended to be interactive. Uh, so please ask questions. We're going to try and save a little bit of time at the end for questions that might not be layout specific. Um, our plan for today is Jen's going to demo some layout stuff on a site she's been working on. Um, anything else about the process? We can okay. see what questions come up as we go. Um, well, Wilbur, how about a quick introduction and just say, have you have you had a change? <laughs> Wilbur just put up a, a, a backdrop site recently. Maybe. Have you, had a, have you yep. had a chance to play with the layouts much? Did you use it? Yep. Uh, so I built a, a backdrop website um, last week. And um, I use the uh, what's the standard theme? Basis. Uh, basis. The basis theme, and um, I added some layout stuff, and I kind of looked around in that, and I can give a little demo maybe later if you guys want to take a look at what I did. So it's pretty simple. Sure. So uh, I'm a heavy Drupal developer. Uh, mostly, my expertise is in maintaining seven sites and. Uh, so I'm interested in getting um, Drush going. And I have a complicated Drush install. So that'll be exciting things to get that running. So <laughs> I've not been very successful with that yet. So but I think we'll get it. Sounds like a topic for a future user group. Yeah. OK. Jen, do you want to share screen? And I'm Jen. Um, I've done a lot of stuff with Backdrop. I'm currently working on a site. It's probably the one I'm going to demo for you guys today, although if you want to see different ones, we could do that too. I'm currently working on a site that's an upgrade from Drupal 6. So I went from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 and Drupal 7 to Backdrop. And um, a lot of the stuff is exactly the same. Some of the views uh, carried right over. And a lot of the stuff is uh, entirely new. So all the layout stuff, for example, is um, replacement of things I've been doing with panels in Drupal 6, but sort of threw out and started over. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of fun to go through that process of um, how do you do a layout in Backdrop the way you did a panel in Drupal 6, because you're not exactly coming from the way panels worked in <laughs> Drupal 7 either. So uh, it's been it's been fun, but uh, hopefully I can show off some of the stuff that I got working in it. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started, I think. Uh, okay. Um, well, this is very uh, casual. I just figured I'd kind of show off the stuff that I have been doing. So I'm going to go mm -hmm. ahead and do a screen share. But if you guys want to see something in particular, um, or if I'm going too fast over a given topic, you are more than welcome to interrupt me and say, oh, wait, go back and show that more. Um, so let's see here. Um, this is the site. And I'm not done yet. <laughs> So as we go through it, you might find like there might be things that aren't working quite right. Uh, we're sort of in, in the all of the content is there, but not all of the layouts are done yet stage. So it'll be a good sort of demonstration of layouts. Um, so let's see. Right now, uh, we, oh, uh oh, OK. <laughs> I'm like trying to get all the windows out of the way. Maybe I'll just leave it. Um, right now, we're looking at, uh, it's called uh, Fashion Schools. Um, we're looking at a layout landing page. This is a taxonomy term page. 
Um, and it's got like the page title at the top that has some featured content. This is actually in a slideshow. Um, some of the view modes look like they haven't been set up yet, which is fine. Slideshow is huge on this page. And then uh, underneath that, we have um, a custom content type ad block sort of thing. Um, this is a taxonomy term description just showing up here. And then this is the normal taxonomy term view um, at the bottom of the page. And we have a um, promo that's not built yet. And yeah, this is great it's site in, in the middle of development. Um, and then some like widgets that lead to some um, custom uh, lead generation tools that are going to go on here later. So um, this is kind of came from a Drupal 6 site that followed the same general pattern. Uh, and we are using, so there's a ton of taxonomy pages. So we're using taxonomy menu to build all of our menus. Every one of these is a vocabulary. So like vocabulary for programs, vocabulary for people. So all these landing pages are taxonomy term pages. So the same pattern sort of goes across the entire site, which hopefully um, will make it consistent and easy to manage. And then, um, Every individual piece of content has uh, a separate layout. This is the previous one was one column, this one's got two columns. Um, and so there's some uh, different layouts per content type stuff going on too. So if, um, I wanna show you what that looks like from the layouts interface. <clears throat> you can see here, I've got a bunch of different layouts going on. Um, my default layout is just that one column one that we saw on the taxonomy term page. And then, um, I've got a couple of specific overrides for uh, like the locations page itself. And then one of the vocabularies, which I haven't filtered down yet, will also have a different layout where we've got uh, three columns of links in the, in the middle of it. I think I have an example of that page here. Um, it's not here yet. Um, but there's gonna be another page with an, another section with three columns. We can go into how that works later if you want. Um, and so here I'm using a selection criteria for which term it is. It's just one term. And here I'll have a selection criteria for which vocabulary it is, which I don't have set up yet. And I have a bunch of standalone pages that just have paths, like scholarship was just one I built at one URL, programs is one another one, people is one another one. Um, and these are gonna be landing pages for the vocabulary. So rather than having um, a taxonomy term page. This is going to show all of the content in a given vocabulary. And then I have a couple of overrides for the node path. So there's a general one that will work on every content type, which is the two column one. And then I have a couple of types of content that just use the one column layout. So it's a page and web form. And then I have a homepage layout, which is a little different from everything else, as you'd probably expect, and um, a couple of other standalone pages. So some of these, I don't know how much you want me to talk about this page, but some of these are custom. Uh, I'm usually pretty good about making different icons for my custom layouts than the ones that are in core. So like you can see the home page one and the category uh, page layout is uh, different. And then all the other one, I'm just using core layouts and then I've overridden the template files for those in some cases in my theme. Um, let's see, what should we look at? Maybe the taxonomy ones, and so we're exciting. When, when we were preparing, you said you code a lot of your own layouts. Is yes. That, you just mean you make custom ones. Yeah, like uh, usually I try and start with a core layout. I'm like, oh, you know, this design, I think I have the design open here. Hey. Like this design closely matches, you know, something that we have in core. And then I'll say, oh, actually it's a little different because I'm gonna have an extra stripe somewhere. And so then I'll just take the core layout, copy it, and add the new region. Um, and then it's, you know, it still starts from something that's really similar to the core layouts, but uh, I end up with a, a copy. So like you can see this is called BGP Geary instead of just Geary, right? When I use, there's a Geary layout in core. I just added uh, two more rows to the Geary layout in this case. Do you want to see that code? Is that going to be more exciting than seeing the content, or should we do both? Both. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Hey. Hey. OK, so this is the category page layout. 
um, which maps to uh, this California page, for example, where at the top we have the slideshow, and then we have, um, this is just a bunch of, a list of all schools in California. This is the taxonomy term. This is the other stuff. So we look on the back, um, in the header, that's all the stuff that we have on every page. Uh, school, uh, find a sc fashion school logo, um, find a school button. I have a search thing in here. I'm not sure if you guys saw that. This is kind of fun. Um, something my designer came up with and we put on all these uh, BGP sites, which is kind of nice. Um, and then there is uh, the main menu. This is just the standard um, smart menu that comes in Backdrop Core. We've got the normal page title up there at the top. We just styled it. And then uh, featured articles. This is the slideshow. Uh, school data. This is just this list of schools. And we have, and this is, you know, there's school data here is one column, and here it's three. This is just styled with CSS to be a three column list, so not actually layout related. Um, here's the extra column or extra row that I have on some pages. Um, and then I have this three column, this is what made it the Geary, this three column section where every taxonomy term has the ability to add uh, sub cues. I don't know. So if you had three different sets of lists you wanted for like California, you can curate um, the content that would appear there and you'll get the three listings. So that was what the, you might have seen in the design. Um, right here, you could have like, here's school information for California or program information or settings, whatever. And you can link to all the articles. And so managing that with node queue, sub queues, and um, they just appear in the, in the layout. So that's where the three columns are. The, the queue title is what you saw me editing where I added left, center, and right. And then this is, this is views for the sub queues for left, center, and right. And then the content, this is main page content. This is just a taxonomy term description and any fields added to it, like a term image. Um, uh, and then featured schools is the custom content type. The Quinn Street pool listing isn't live right now, but there's a tool named Quinn Street that'll give you um, uh, a lead gen source, which we use on some sites. Uh, taxonomy term listing, that's the one that says recent articles. And then the promo at the bottom, which is going to be an animation. It's not, there'll be some other kind of contest, but. And then the find school widget <laughs> is the bar at the bottom. So it, this page has a lot of rows, right? Footer and then all of this stuff. So uh, all of this, like, um, footer above, bottom above, this is all stuff that I added to the BGP uh, layout, middle above the top. So there's a bunch of additional rows that were added just to compensate for the striping in the layout. Like you wouldn't normally need those, except for that I find it easier to do the striping across the whole page as a row, like if this is a bleed. Um, I like to add a row rather than trying to like style a block to go all the way to the edges of the page, like the hero. Um, let's see. Do you guys want to see the code for this one, or should I do a demonstration of another more well, can, I, can I just clarify? What, if I understand what you're saying, is that rather than put multiple blocks in an individual row, you're creating rows for each block wh where you want them to like, stretch across the page. Yeah, so it's more of a color bleed choice, like right. where... Uh, where I have a color change like this one, and yeah. there's a gray row, and then there's a white row, and then there's a gray row. Like I could have tried to do um, one layout that was all full bleed that had blocks that went all the way across the top, but because on a lot of pages, um, that's not the design I was working with. I just figured I would do one layout that had a row for each color, and then it would be easy to color each row. Like, oh, this bottom one's always blue and it's always full bleed. But I had some pages where like the middle one wasn't full bleed, it was just white all the way through. So, I don't know, this is another thing that's like, really depends on what your designer wants and what the person building the site, like there's any way, any number of ways to do this. I just choose to do a row for each background color. Right, I think I've done the same thing and that really means then taking an existing template, right, and creating your own yeah. And because you can't add a row to an existing template through the UI. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. That's what um, Doc Wilmot has made 
this is maybe a good time to talk about that a uh, module called uh flexible layouts i think i don't have the chat open right now yeah, flexible um, layout. flexible layouts which is really similar to um uh the layout builder mm -hmm. layout from panels and i noticed recently after i think we I talked last time about the uh, layout Doc Moment was working on. There's a theme called WordPress called Divi that is a visual layout builder that allows you to add rows and columns and place blocks in them, um, which I think uh, this is an example of a front end interface where you can do it. They also have a back end interface that looks a little bit more like our layout system. Um, but uh, it's something that I think everybody in, well, not everybody in the WordPress community, but a whole bunch of people in the WordPress community really love this tool because it allows them to take advantage of layouts without needing to, you know, um, code their own, right? Everything you want, you just add a new row um, from the front end. And so I think having something like the module that Doc Walmart worked on that allowed the layout builder functionality and backdrop would be a fantastic candidate for core because it'll enable more people to do more things without even needing to know how to code a layout. So. Um, I would love to see us focus on that for something in the future where we can have um, more click together layouts. And uh, I mentioned before the call too that I code most of my layouts and that I haven't been using this tool, but I also mentioned that maybe I should start using the module so that we can get uh, more feedback on user experience there and make sure that it can account for all the different use cases that come up in building sites. So I would love to see something like that in backdrop. Um, do you guys want to see the code? It's not very exciting. Uh, so this is the BGP Geary layout I was talking about. Um, I added like the top below region, um, middle above region, bottom above and footer above. So I added like four rows just to get those four different colors. Um, and then in the uh, template itself, there's just a bunch of sections that say, um, you know, if content top, content top. If content top two, content top two. So it's exactly just a copy of the row that was already there, already there, um, just with different CSS identifiers and obviously printing the different content. Um, and so having the outer wrapper and then the inner wrapper means that I can have a full bleed background stripe and then the content still centered along with everything else on every breakpoint. So um, I haven't looked at this recently. Hopefully it's not broken. <laughs> um, so like uh, the content is a, a specific width. That's what the container fluid thing does in Bootstrap. So that as you make your browser like larger and smaller, it'll still line up at all the same places without me needing to code any of the um, styles of where those uh, container widths end. So I like to use core layouts and modify them just so I can get that same behavior. <clears throat> um, oh, sorry, I meant to stop my screen sharing. Uh, is there anything else you guys want to see in particular? I know uh, uh, you wanted, Tim, you mentioned you wanted to save some time at the end to talk about things that weren't layout related. So I don't want to, don't want to spend too much time mattering about layouts. But I did want to see if there was anything in particular you guys were curious about how to handle with layouts. Um, just kind of showing you how I build sites is maybe not the best use of our time, but maybe you're finding it interesting. Well, I so I recall that when I did my first backdrop sites, that the, la the layout system was one of the hardest things to adjust to from coming from Drupal 7. Yeah, it's right? very it was, it was the biggest paradigm shift, right? Um, and so I'm trying to remember like what were some of those things. I mean, part of this this video is could be kind of a, tut a tutorial of it or introduction for beginners. So beyond the people here, there might be some beginners looking at it. I think we should talk or sh we should at least look at uh, it, uh, condition you know some of the condition things you can do with layouts. And also, um, I think one of the things I struggled with was priority, right? Like which which layout it comes first. Which yeah. comes first, and yeah. if you could talk briefly about that. Sure. So I have a couple of instances. Maybe I'll share my screen again. I'll just mm -hmm. advance for the um, cascading. 
craziness. Ah, okay. Uh, so in my layout list, I have two taxonomy term layouts and two node layouts. Um, so uh, these are the confusing ones for most people because the path you enter has a percent in it, which is something that's kind of mind boggling for people that you put in a percent to indicate like all nodes that live at node slash anything. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite work like a wild star. Like if you created a page and went node slash for like the word for, it's not gonna work the same as um, the internal system path. So that's why we use the percent and not a star. But it is a little bit my, like crazy for people to figure out how to do that in the first place. And then once you have one that works for like all nodes, trying to set up other ones that work for some kinds of nodes does create this issue where like you have to figure out what order you want them to come in. Um, and then even when you know what order you want them to come in, like finding this reorder button on the top right in order to change that is also like maybe not very intuitive for people. So for me, I always start, when I'm building a site, I always start um, using the default layout and I choose my most uh, basic uh, design to start from. So usually that's a page, just a normal page, something like a um, privacy policy or you know something really boring. And then I try and make my default layout match that. And then if that layout has something specific like a block for a field, um, in a sidebar or something like that. Then I will create the node layout. Um, and uh, in my case, I created just the regular node layout and it looked exactly like the, the um, basic uh, default layout. But then uh, I realized that the page on this site is actually different from all of my other content in that it doesn't have field blocks. Um, but the, all of the other ones do. And so that's when I created the second layout here and changed the layout layout from uh, one column to a two column. And then I added the condition for a basic page in web form. Well, first it was basic page. And then later when I got to web form, I added web form um, to page. And so that was something where um, I did actually have to come in here and change the order of these pages. Cause this always operates top to bottom in an if else fashion. So here I'll say if, the content type is one of page web form, use this layout, and then it'll stop. And if it's not page or web form, it'll fall through to a node. In the, in the same way that it'll go through all of these layouts on the top, and if none of them match, it'll fall through to default. Um, the same thing happens for any given path match. Um, so the only condition I have here um, is the <laughs> one for page and uh, web form. And then um, for taxonomy terms, um, it looks like the way I have this set up right now, that it won't work, if anyone noticed that. So my first one has no conditions, the category layout. My first one has no conditions set, so it will always be used. Uh, my second one has a condition set, but it doesn't matter because there's nothing that will ever stop the first one from working. Um, and so if I wanted the locations layout to be used, I would need to reorder them. Now I haven't actually set up my locations layout yet, so I don't know what'll happen if I do this. It's fun, we'll do it anyway. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, it's going to have different content in it because this on uh, my site, the locations taxonomy term page is a parent of all of, uh, the, uh, terms in that section. So I think on my site locations is schools and colleges, and it's going to have like a map on it. Um, and the map will be different from everything else. So I don't know. It's going to go on here. Uh, looks like right now that's probably where the map goes. There's nothing different about this layout yet, except for this big blank hole in, in the page that isn't built. Um, but yeah, if I want this to actually be used on the school and college locations, they need to be in the right order. So if I'd done it before and I'd gone to this page, this wouldn't have been here. It would have been the same as the other pages, which I think is um, nothing there right now. So here um, I have added a condition for the taxonomy term ID. Um, I usually have, uh, I usually add another condition. I don't remember. Um, there's some patch that I add to core for taxonomy to add addition, additional visibility condition, but I don't remember which one it is. It might not be on this site yet but there, it might be something for like term depth. I think that's what it is. 
So like if you want the parent level categories to have different layout than the child, you can put in, um, there's a core patch I add for term depth so that you can say if the depth is one, use one layout. And if the depth is more than one, then use another one. Um, I do not usually use uh, conditions on individual blocks. I know that you can do this. Um, and I think when I first started setting up backdrop sites, I would try and use as few layouts as possible. And on each layout, I would add a ton of blocks into each region. And then each block would have visibility conditions. Uh, you can do that if that it works better for your model. But I found that um, working with a site, it just made more sense to me to have a separate layout with different blocks placed than it did to have one layout with different blocks appearing and not appearing. And I don't know if that's how other people do it too or not. Um, but yeah, like I could have had, um, rather than having two layouts under taxonomy term, I could have chosen one layout and then in that section on, um, you know, sub pages, it would say school data category pages. And then on the parent page, it would have been the map. And then each of those blocks would appear in one instance and not in the other. And you can use the same visibility condition here for um, adding a taxonomy term ID as you can on the parent layout. But for some reason, it didn't make as much sense to me when I was managing them to do it that way. So I chose to do it the other way, but both would work. I was going to ask about that because I, I think my first inclination would have been to just put a visibility condition on the block. Yeah. Right. Um, rather than having two different layouts, but that's an interesting approach. Yeah, and I don't. I don't know that um, there's any uh, reason to do one over the other. I think it's all just preference. My preference ended up being having more layouts. Sure. Um, I think that might have also been uh, for a configuration import export. It made more sense for me to be like, okay, well, if I'm just going to make one change to one page, I'll just export and import that one config file rather than being like, okay, well, if I export and import this config file, it might affect other pages as well. So it might have just been something that matched my <coughs> like deploying changes better than having one that affected many pages. I don't know. I don't know why. That's just what I decided to do. Could be a year from now, I change my mind and start doing it the other way. <laughs> Maybe it's different for each project. I don't know. I have been, so a lot of the, the sites I've been working on for the past few years sort of match this same model. They're all um, uh, these BGP sites where uh, they all are very taxonomy based. They're all several content types that fit into the same taxonomy across the whole site. Um, and they're all sort of lead gen sites and they, they do the same kinds of things. And it could be that as I start doing different kinds of sites, maybe this model will be a less of a comfortable fit and I'll go back to doing it the other way for the other sites. Is there any performance considerations with layouts? Um, I'm sure there are. <laughs> I haven't run into any issues. I know layouts themselves are, are cached. So once you have a layout given for a specific path, it uh, that gets, faster. So like the first time you set it up, it'll be like, oh, hold on, there's a layout here. And then after that, it'll be like, I know which layout it is for that path. Um, I don't think it makes any difference whether you have 10 layouts or two total, because they are, it's always cached to that path. So if it's like use one of two or use one of 10, it's not going to make any difference beyond You're gonna that. You're going to use one anyway, right? right? Yeah. OK. I think the only, the real thing will be like the number of um, config files you're working with, right? If you have 100 layouts, that's 100 layout config files. And then, um, uh, yeah, just managing managing the visibility rules. I think for me, another thing that makes it a little easier is that when you look at the layouts page, it lists the conditions right there so you know when they're fine and when they're not. But on a block, on the block manage blocks page, they're all buried in each block. And so you can't necessarily see, actually, I don't know that. They might actually be printed in the block description, but because I don't use them very often, <laughs> I don't see them there. Maybe I shouldn't say that. It's probably fine either way. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's just what I chose to do. I think that um, 
there are, I do have some sites that get slower than others, but I think the main thing that causes my slower sites to be slow is the size of the menu. Like the menus get really big. If I have, if I put all of my articles like in the menu, if I have a, a thousand taxonomy terms that are all in the menu system. Um, when you go to render your main menu and it's a drop down menu and it shows every page on the site, that's the slowest part of the render process is just building the menu. And especially if you have, you know, you're logged in and you have different permissions, like it's going to be rebuilding that menu often. Um, so I have, um, I'm working on a module called menu, menu block cache or something like that. I'm trying to figure out like all the different places I can safely cache that menu and see if that'll speed things up. Um, but it hasn't been super successful yet. <laughs> Uh, so I'm trying to uh, get that to a point where it's stable, and then I'll, I'll create a release of it. Uh, if anybody has any questions, ask them. I mean, I wonder if it would make sense to spend a few minutes looking closer at the different like conditions for either layouts or blocks. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of them pretty quickly, but it might be interesting to look at what all the options are that we have available to us. Does that make sense? Could you do you want to do that again for us? Sure. Um, so I'm going to do it on the layout because that's where I'm more comfortable mm -hmm. dealing with this. Um, and uh, let's just start with a normal one. So let's do like home page and see. Mm -hmm. Maybe your layout. Okay. So visibility conditions on a layout that does not have any context are fairly limited. Uh, Jen, I don't think you're sharing yet. Oh, thank you. You are correct. I am not sharing. Here we go. Uh, everything screen share. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm on the homepage layout, and I've just opened the visibility add visibility, add visibility condition modal, um, and you can see that the options here are pretty limited because there's no context on this page. So I could say, you know, show if it's the front page show based on a specific language. So if I have a multilingual site, um, I can choose language. Um, I can do based on URL path. This is actually one I end up using a lot because sometimes I find that the uh, visibility condition that I want doesn't exist, like there isn't a tool for it, but I have a path pattern that I can match. Um, and so I will often use this as a kind of a workaround. Um, I can't think of any examples of that I could show you right now, but I will see if one comes to mind. Um, so something like uh, if I wanted to limit this to a file path, right? Like there isn't a file, um, uh, a file visibility condition, but I could do something like file star and that would catch like all of the files at that path. So something like that. Um, uh, Let's see, user account UID. So this is something I usually only use on uh, the user, user ID. This would be like for logged in user. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I've ever used this. I use the user account UID visibility condition only on a user profile page. Like if I wanted to have a special dashboard for uh, you know one particular user who's my like hotshot super admin, um, and I want to put a whole bunch of special admin blocks on their page, I might be like, okay, if, you, if user ID is four, then do something different. But I haven't used it other than that. Um, then let's see, there's also user permission, user role. These I use a lot. Um, I find that I use user role more than user permission, although I know user permission is safer. <laughs> this is very specific. Uh, I often have uh, some things where I'm just like, I want all my editors to have access to this page, or I want all of my editors to see a different layout um, for a particular path. Like maybe there's a, side, a sidebar that shows up that has management tools on it or links to related content or something like that. Um, user permission is safer because it's something that you have to specifically grant to your roles. User role is a little loose because you can change permissions on stuff and that page might still show up even if there's stuff on that page they aren't supposed to see. But I find that in site building, I find user role um, a lot, it's a much better match to what I'm actually um, thinking rather than technically building. 
it, can we slow down and flesh out a, a use case for that? So it's like, if I want, are you suggesting that maybe if you wanted to add a block or, or so it'd be a different layout, you want the editor to see the same page, but with a different layout or? Yeah, so for example, let's take like a news article, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at a news article and when anyone is viewing that article, say it's like a, a one column layout centered with, you know, just a long bleed of text. But if I'm an editor for the site, um, maybe I want to see like other articles by the same author. Um, I could put a block in a sidebar that is other articles by the same author. Um, and then I could have the news layout appear at, you know, node slash percent where type is news um, for everyone. And then above that, I would have another one that said node slash percent type is news user role is editor. And then there would be a specific column added or specific layout use that has an extra column uh, when editors are looking at that page. And that way they can say, okay, here's this article. And then if I need to refer to other stuff this person's built, there's a handy list right there, which will get me straight to them. And maybe that list will have like edit links or if you're using, um, you know, some kind of moderation, it could have, um, you know, uh, show whether the article's published or not or publish date or whatever your editors need for your workflow. You can just kind of plonk it right there and they can see, okay, this person has six articles pending. Um, maybe we don't worry about the one I'm looking at now and I'll go look at those other ones instead or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does and that's helpful. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions right now? No? Okay. How, so go ahead. One other thing I just want to say, like the um, the number of conditions you get for a page without context is fairly limited. But if you look at like the node context, here there are um, more visibility conditions because you have the node properties available. So here you have like content type and content node ID. Um, I also have a couple of sites where I've built additional custom visibility conditions. Um, and those, like you might add a specific field value um, is something that I end up doing where it's like, oh, you know, I need the news article to have a different layout, whether it's a press release or whether it's a news story. Um, and so sometimes that's a field on a news content type. And I could have chosen to do different, different content types, like one called press release and one called news story. But my workflow didn't exactly match that. Like I had editors that wanted to create news stories and they wanted, you know, all of the fields to be the same on those two content types. So it made more sense to just add another field to let them choose what kind of news it was. So then I would add a visibility condition here for this. And that's um, a little bit more complicated. I had to you know, write a custom module that included that, but um, it is possible. It's the kind of thing where I'm like, I don't really know if this needs to be in core or not, but there probably should be a contrib solution that lets you choose like how to do that just seemed really complicated to get from my like add one field to build the UI to let people choose which fields get <laughs> visibility conditions. It's on my to-do list. Um, but yeah, so there's all, even though in here you can see how like some additional things are added, you really do have a lot more um, power here. Like you can access anything on the node uh, where the context is available. That could be a topic for a, a blog post too. Yeah. Okay. Like we don't have enough of those. Yeah. I'll put it also on my to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So are, are, did you have anything else that you thought was worth highlighting or? No, not really. I mean, there's so much, there's so much to talk about and I don't know what's like super intuitive and what's useful. Like, I don't know if, the way I do things is any different from the way guys you guys have sort of like after playing with right. it for a little bit just landed on the same solutions or not. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what's the best use of our time to talk well, about. I would suggest one thing. Go ahead. Uh, one thing I didn't understand was that reorder that if you didn't have a context set, it wouldn't cascade. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I. That's kind of new. I didn't realize that. So that might be why certain things weren't happening. 
Yeah, and there are, um, I have found some limitations in like, I would rather have one layout work for like two unique paths. And there isn't a way you can do that right now. You have to have separate layouts, even if they have exactly the same blocks on them. If you have two different paths, they have to be separate. Um, and I would rather have there be like one and you have a reorder thing where if you wanted to control the order, you can, or if you want to just it to work on all of them that to work that way too. Um, so I definitely think there's room for improvement. I find that um, building these sites is really fun, but then managing them, you're like, oh, I have to make a change to four layouts. That's not so much fun. <laughs> Um, but yeah, having the reorder thing only work when there's a shared path, I think is confusing. Some people don't even know it's there at all. Um, yeah, I think there's, <laughs> this interface isn't, um, it takes some, it takes some getting used to. It's better than panels, but you know, it's a complicated tool and trying to build an intuitive interface for a complicated tool is hard. So in our, um, Discussion about config management, uh, we asked the provocative question of just, uh, I don't know if Luke's listening, of how, just how, what people's experience has been using it. And that led us down the whole path. Um, is anybody else, is, I, I've already mentioned that, I, you know, I love the, the layout system and I find it really powerful, but it was the biggest paradigm shift from Drupal 7. So it, it took a while for me to wrap my head around it. I'm curious what other people's experiences were. Yes. Could you say anything more about that? <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> typically I was using Omega and a lot of Display Suite. So with Omega, you could completely erase, you know, have regions that didn't show up um, in the UI. And you could also, like, if I had a, wanted to have three or four block or four regions at the top, I could put four regions at the top in that zone and then use display suite to do a lot of fancy stuff along with context um, and rules and things like that. So the layout system is just, has some limitations or some things that uh, display suite could do that you can't do. Yeah, that's what I've been wrapping my head around. So otherwise, you know, just keep plugging away. Yeah, I found, um, I, I used panels in Triple Seven instead of Omega. And I found that because this is a board of panels, it mapped almost exactly to what I was doing before in terms of mental model. But I have a couple of sites that I inherited that were using Omega. And the way that you solve problems with Omega is sort of like the inside out version of the way that you solve them with panels. And so there's a lot of power there in terms of like starting with the region and then adding more stuff that way. And it all kind of fits into a layout. And I think that we need to um, kind of take a look at this stuff that is missing that you were able to do in Omega in particular, like choosing layout, layouts for individual view modes and figuring out how we get that integrated in with the layout system that we have um, in Backdrop. Uh, I don't know how Omega integrated with rules. That would be really interesting to see. Um, uh, I don't know if you have any examples of that or if you could talk to that a little bit, but that would be good to, because we have rules for Backdrop. It might be interesting to see if we can get the rules to work with layouts in the same way that rules used to work with Omega. Um, well, it was more, I, more uh, using rules with, um, Display Suite um, than Omega. <clears throat> so I used a lot of Path. Uh, some there were some other contexts too, but I don't. I, I'd have to look at it and remember. Okay. Yeah. So I found um, also I think if we can get that layout builder tool that we talked about at the beginning that Andy had been working on in core that might solve some of those same problems of like, I just want to add another row or I just want to add another column to this region. Um, I think if we can get that in, then that will sort of fill that site builder instinct of like, I need to change my, I have an existing layout, I just need to change one thing, I want to drop it in. Um, that's something that, you know, if you have to custom code your layouts, then you have to make that change, you have to custom code that change in. And that's a, a very different perspective than like just having all those tools in the user interface. And one Which thing I think, 
Backdrop is really good at is giving people tools and user interface and then getting to a place where you say, oh, sorry, you have to do that in code. is isn't, <laughs> like, it doesn't really fit with the rest of the, what we're trying to give people. So I think the more we can focus on giving that power back um, and keeping it all in the interface, I think the better. So that would, so what you're aiming for is something like you talked about the Divi backend builder. Yeah, I think yeah. that'll match more to, um, uh, in Omega, how you can just specify like how many rows yeah. do you want in this place and how many columns do you want in the row. Um, and I don't know uh, uh, with Display Suite, I don't remember the diff distinction. I know I've had Omega themes I've had to maintain. I don't n remember the differences between Display Suite and panels um, other than what you can do with view modes. So. Um. There's probably a lot of improvement there too we could do. Yeah, the um, with the space where you can go in and actually have it rewrite some of your HTML. And we had some custom forms that we used and that was really handy. Huh. Uh, just cut down on all the all the markup. Yeah. And um, anyway, that's a long discussion. Yeah, well, I think that's kind of the direction we're going in anyway with the block, um, you know, control over your markup you can do with blocks. Um, I would love to see more of that. I don't know how much of that needs to be in court. Like, I think if we could get something like fences module um, uh, where it lets you control the markup of all of your fields, or if we could get something like, um, uh, even if we had a display suite for backdrop, if we could figure out how to get <laughs> those to line up. I think that might be a really powerful tool. Like, I think having those tools in Contrib um, is going to be really valuable to our community in general. So we're talking about display suites. I use display suites a lot with Drupal 7. And I think okay. I, I'm just going to mention this. It may or may not be obvious to people. But one of the things that I found really helpful about the layouts right, was the ability to create blocks, field blocks, sort of right out with core. right? So. I could what I would do in display suites, right, is create a layout and put fields in different in different blocks in the layout, and that's right there. And the, you can do that with uh, with layouts and, and backdrop core. So I don't know if anybody else has done that or how obvious it is. I don't think it was odd. I'm I'm partly mentioning it because I think it took me a while to realize I could do that. Well, one of the yeah. things that you could do is also um, create custom layouts on your form inputs. So that was one thing with display suite, you could go in there. And, yeah, you can do uh, that with panels too. And that's one piece that hasn't been ported to Backdrop Core that I think we need. I yeah. love customizing my user interfaces for creating content. That's something mm -hmm. I feel like my editors get a lot out of. And it's something that I have been missing in Backdrop. Um, yeah. So we had, we had some things that had, uh, I had, um, a couple of content types had 50 fields on them. That's a lot. Yeah. And to have a single column form and have to scroll all the way down the page was just when all you needed to do is have little blocks, put this, put this, and then some entity references that auto filled. You know, to scroll down 50 fields is a lot. So that was a real handy tool. Yeah. <laughs> just really quick, I want to show you guys what I did. So I have been running into that exact problem where I have, um, even on this site, I have a lot of uh, fields. And so what I ended up doing is like um, creating an admin theme where anything that was like a taxonomy, <laughs> just like put in a box. <laughs> I was like, maybe if I can just get them closer together, maybe it'll like make, make it a little easier to manage. Um, but yeah, so I totally feel the pain there. When you have too much stuff on the form, it's just not, not good. Say again how you did that? I just have an admin theme mm -hmm. where I uh, took all of my taxonomy fields and I was like, uh, display inline block and then background color. And that was it. Yep. And so it's a mess. Like, they're, they're all but they're closer together. I'll eventually go through and like organize them. But since I figured I didn't know what order they're supposed to be in or anything now, it, um, it's a slight improvement, <laughs> but it does, need to, it does need a little polish. So can I, Wilbur, can I put you on the spot? You just built your first backdrop site, right? Did, how was your, did you use layouts much? How was your experience? 
You know, uh, I didn't. I didn't. I, I have hardly any content on this site. I just stood it up. And so uh, your description of the layout builder was really, uh, I get it now. And I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have stumbled upon that. So, cause it's kind of a different paradigm that I'm used to working with. So, um, but that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I think that Divi tool will be interesting or something like that to, to build, to build things out in that layout builder would be interesting. So, um, so yeah, I didn't, I, I just, I just tried to, I just redid the front page layout and uh, now I see that it's exactly how you laid it out. You have the base layout and then this, they stack on top of each other and they, they kind of cascade down. You get the first one and then you're out. It, it matches and then if it doesn't, it keeps going till it gets to the base layout at the bottom. So that's, that's really intuitive and that's, that, that seems great. So, and I, I was looking where context went and now I see that that's, that's how that, how that rolls out so yeah context is also something that is really confusing for people who are new to Drupal um, at least in with panels because uh, you have to define it which is people are like I don't understand how to tell it what context I need so in backdrop we tried to make it automatic like as much as we could like if you know node slash percent is in the system we can add that context automatically and we're hoping that'll help kind of train people what context is so if you go to create a path that's something that backdrop doesn't know about like something in contrib um you'll see it's like oh you know the percent sign is in the second position and so i'm going to tell it that that's a um i don't know a paragraph id or whatever it is that you're adding um, but yeah, it's definitely something that's a little bit magical and adding those contexts is what currently makes all of those blocks appear. So like all of the field blocks only appear when you have a node that has fields on it as a context. Um, that's why you couldn't find them initially, Tim, is because they don't show up if you don't have the context there. And so there is an issue that uh, Gregory is working on that would make all of the blocks available so that when you go into that thing and you search for it, it will tell you, oh, you know, there's a field, there's an image field block, but then in the description it would say, um, must have node context present or something like that. And then it would say, create a, create a layout at node slash percent to add node context or something that would help kind of steer people in the right direction. Because I think there's a lot of great functionality here that you only find if you know about it, like you can't find it by accident and it won't train you how to use it. It's just not there until you get it. And then you're like, oh, it's there. And I think that we could do a better job of sort of guiding people to, um, I, I want a field block. How do I, where do I put it? How do I get access to it? Um, and so Gregory's working on that. And I think initially uh, we didn't have all of those things appear in the block list because we thought we would be trying to show people the whole block list. We thought people would be trying to read it but it turns out when we have a search box there, nobody reads anything. <laughs> Just type in field. And if there's no field block there, uh, then that, that's a, you know, they think you can't do it. Um, so there's an issue about how to, how to do that in a way that's sensible. Okay. We started uh, about 1130 our time, and it's, almost, it's about 20 after 12. So I'd like to keep this to an hour. Um, does anybody have any non layout related questions that they want to throw out quick if not i have one or two more layout things i can come back to but i wanted to allow a little bit of time for just to open anything or wilbur did you did you want to show what you were working on yeah uh, i'll show up next time i gotta i gotta okay. run actually i gotta okay bow out, so okay thanks a lot it was really nice nice topic it was really informative great anybody else have anything So I'm going to mention one last thing then about layouts that I was excited about <laughs> was that I, I'm trying to remember the exact context why, but I know in both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, I've tried to create front pages that are completely custom, right? That there's nothing on them and then put my own, just drop my own blocks on them. And that turned out to be way more difficult than I thought it would be. And in backdrop, that's not a problem, right? We just, you have a front page layout and you can take you know, things like the page title or the login block. I, I want to say it was like the login block was super hard to get rid of on, in Drupal. It was like built into the default template or something, right? If with, I mean, you could, the, the, you could solve it with a custom template, but you had to do code. 
right? And you don't have, and I think that you don't have to do that in backdrop. I don't know about the login block in particular, but I do know that one of the things we were trying to solve with layouts was I just want a page. Like I just want a page on my site and I want to put stuff on it. And that's something that in Drupal for forever has been really hard. It's like you can't, you have to make a node and not put any content in it, or you can make like uh, a view it returns nothing. <laughs> you can make a panel. Like all of these things are very complicated solutions. Um, and we just thought it would be, you know, that's a that's a very um, common use case. Every site needs a homepage, right? And in that homepage, I've seen a whole bunch of sites that have like a content type called homepage with only one node in it, right? <laughs> You're like, what? That's just the easiest thing for people to do. And we wanted to make that easier. So I'm glad that you felt the joy of being able to use a tool to do that. Um, and hopefully you'll find it handy for lots of other purposes too. Well, I have one other question. I believe it was yesterday, Drupal 7 end of life was announced. So is that when Backdrop 2 is coming out? That's a good question. We um, are still trying to figure out what Backdrop 2 is gonna look like. Um, there are a bunch of people who are thinking that all Backdrop 2 will do is remove everything that's marked as deprecated and there won't actually be any API changes. Um, but we do have a list of things that we want to do that require API changes. So we're trying to figure out like, is it possible to do those things uh, in a backwards compatible way? And if not, we will at some point have to have breaking changes and we'll need to figure out um, what the threshold, like like how we're going to do that. But what we found, at least in the first you know four years of Backdrop's existence, is that we're able to do an awful lot without breaking APIs, just by adding things. Like all of the amazing features we've gotten since Backdrop 1.0 went in without breaking um, any of the existing APIs, or at least <laughs> without intentionally breaking them. There have been some bugs introduced that we hopefully have uh, fixed. But um, yeah, and so I think you know, just living in this world where we can add new API additions, it's really easy to say, oh, well, we'll just add a new API, we'll mark the old one as deprecated, and then it's not broken, and then at some point we can remove it. Um, and so it gives us a lot more freedom in terms of what we can do. And so there's also been talk, Nate, I don't know how serious this is, but Nate has this crazy idea of like, what if we just drop the one from backdrop? And so like right now we're on backdrop 12 next backdrop will be backdrop 13. Um, because if we're never going to have a breaking change, why have the indicator that we're going to do that? So I don't think that the Drupal 7 end of life date will correlate to anything in particular that backdrop is going to do. I don't think we need to have a deadline because we have much closer deadlines um, where we're doing a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I think what the Drupal 7 end of life date will do is kind of be like, okay, this is the point where all of the people who are on Drupal 7 will have to make a decision about what they're gonna be doing in the future. Like, are they going to Drupal 8? Are they moving off of Drupal entirely? Are they coming backdrop? Are they throwing out their website? <laughs> they're just gonna let it sit. Um, and so between now and then, that's our chance to say, how do we make this upgrade path as easy as possible? Like, what are the pain points right now in upgrading from Drupal 7 to Backdrop? And can we iron that out so that when they have to try it, it's as painless as possible? So that's kind of our whole goal, right, is to make it upgrade less painful. That's the, you know, that's where we started here. And then maintenance less painful once you're on it. Um, so that, I think, is what we should be focusing on, focusing on between now and end of life. And uh, I don't think we're in any hurry to figure out what backdrop two needs to look like. I think if something comes along that we absolutely need and we need to have breaking changes and we can't do it in a backwards compatible way, that would be a driver to having a backdrop two. Um, but there's so much that we can still do to make it better without that. But I think that we should just sort of carry on in the way that we have been in terms of adding new features and making everything we have better and more usable and more affordable um, and see how much how much better we can get it for people coming from Drupal 7. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, I know just in the last few days, we've gotten a huge increase of people trying backdrop, people asking questions, people joining the forum, um, just because they got the email. They're just like, oh, it's coming. I need to do something. 
And I think that you know everyone has had it in their back of their mind. Their website's kind of old. But when they got that email, it was kind of a motivator for everyone to start exploring other options. So um, I'm expecting that to continue. We'll probably have you know a continued spike for a while, and then it'll get quiet again, and then it'll pick up again as people actually start moving. Um, but yeah, so I'm not seeing any huge change in what we're doing coming down the, down the road because of that. How about a suggestion for the next one of these that we do to do one on porting modules? Sure. Um, I think um, from Drupal, I have played around a little bit. I, I had one that loads, but I'm, think, I'm thinking the problem is it's not finding the path to the JavaScript. But that's for, like I say, that's for another meetup. So um, otherwise, sure. I think that's a great topic. I think we have a list of others, and uh, we'll after this call we'll we'll look at the list. But that seems like a a really good option. Um, in term, we're at about an hour, so we should wrap up. Um, in terms of future these future user groups, I know uh, Gregory. For those who you know Gregory, I think everybody here probably does. Um, mm -hmm. Is in Australia, and it's four a.m. there, or well, now it's five. But um, he has asked that we try and diversify our time slots so that he doesn't have to get up at 4 a.m. So I, I'm tempted to, and I'm welcome to feedback on or after the call about, I don't know, I'm, I'm not like a regular user group benefits a lot from being at the same time on a monthly basis. And I'm not sure, given we've got people from around the world in different time zones that, you know, maybe we just schedule some have them a little more irregular and at different time slots. So different people have the opportunity to participate. Or we could alternate them. So like one month it's at this time and then and the next month it's like eight hours later or something. And then if we alternate it that way, we might get like some people one time and some people the next. Um, I don't know if that would help like the topic. <laughs> like they'd be like, I want the topic you did when I was asleep. Um, but we could try it. I don't know. Well, we're recording them. So oh, that's true. we missed the first one. So there is the advantage that if you don't, if you're not there, you can still watch it. But I'd still like people to participate and ask questions and share. So, yeah, um, yeah. You always got a bias for repeating the the same time at any meeting because the people that show up at that meeting are the ones that can make it at that time. So, yeah, so you always have that particular empathy for those that couldn't make the time where you're having the meeting. Right. Okay. Well, we don't have to settle this right now. We'll think about it and talk more about it, but. We'll get out an announcement uh, about it the next uh, the next user group as quickly as we can. Any last closing comments from anybody else? Thank okay. you for putting this on, Tim. Yeah. Thanks for sharing and doing an improvised demo. Thanks. <laughs> OK, uh, Jen, do you want to stop us? Sure. Well, you should stop us because yeah. you pushed the start button. <laughs> uh, we're going to close it. This is very exciting for me, pushing buttons. <laughs>